it takes an already angry looking plane, makes it look a little bit more aggressive. Hey, hey, how you going guys? Welcome back to Hearns TV. It's uh, me again, Dan, and I'm gonna take you through an unboxing video of a really cool model plane. Uh, this one's very, very unique. Now I've done every, pretty much every kit Actually, no, every kit I've done up until this point has been um, a fairly famous aircraft that has had a very um, uh, robust uh, history around it. This one, uh, not so much. So let me tell you all about this one. Guys, pleased to be meeting the Dornier 335 Fiel, which um, is German for arrow. Uh, this particular one, the Zestrore, uh, obviously meaning destroyer, is a heavy gun version of the plane. And also, take a look, please note the tail of this aircraft. Uh, that's wrong if when I get the right side. Please note the tail of this aircraft because the tail is going to play a very key part in some of the things I tell you about it. Um, very unique looking plane and please, it's got an engine at the front, at the back and the front. Uh, the pusher puller concept. But um, yeah, this thing was designed by a company, Dornier, who uh, were a big producer of aircraft for the Luftwaffe in the Second World War. This particular one uh, saw, it went into production in late 1943. Uh, but due to the fact that there was very limited supply of the correct engines, um, only about 47 of them were ever built and uh, none of them actually saw any active combat whatsoever. Uh, and this particular one, the, the one was meant for destroying um, uh, bombers and intercepting uh, high-flying enemy bombers. It, I don't think any of them were actually built at all. But um, let's learn a little bit more about the, the feel. Anyway, start off with the instructions. This is a 32 scale by Hong Kong Models. And um, yeah, Hong Kong models make some fantastic kits. I'm gonna do some more um, in upcoming videos. But anyway, this one, big instruction book, big instruction book, nice thick paper, and it's smooth, a little bit glossy, but not, not quite a full gloss. And there's the, the aircraft again on the front. Such a unique looking plane. Um, and we'll just flick through. I like big instructions, nice and clear, easy to read. And let's skip through the construction side of things because we're going to have a look at oh, the camouflage patterns. Um, would have been nice if these were in color, but in um, black and white, you, you still get the point though. And it's got all the, you know, the color listings there. I like these jagged sharp edges on the camouflage. It takes an already angry looking plane, makes it look a little bit more aggressive. When it comes to air-to-air -air combat, not only do you want to be fully functional and have all the right gear and maneuverability, but you really want to look at the part as well. Um, and also with the German markings, um, we've also got here in British, um, which is, uh, we'll look at the, um, I think the decal in this one is actually, it has German and French because a number of these were actually captured by the Allies and went through some fairly vigorous testing. Uh, the Americans tested it, so did the British, and they were suitably impressed um, with what this plane could do. Uh, and here we have on the back, just before we go, I'll lift this up so you can see these are all the, uh, some of the uh, different variants and the different camouflage patterns. I really like that one, actually. I really like the Night Fighter one. If I made this kit, that's the one that I would do it in. So put the instructions over there. Now, Let's have a look, see, at the fuselage of the Dornier 335. And here we have the wing roots, where the wings would be, and the rear engine, and the front engine. Um, because, it, because of the pusher-puller um, configuration of the engine, uh, this thing was remarkably fast, 763 kilometers an hour, making it not only the fastest piston engine of uh, the Luftwaffe, but I think it was also the fastest piston engine of the entire Second World War. Um, 
uh, not only that, if one of its engines stopped working, it could still maintain over 500 kilometers an hour, um, which is pretty impressive. And um, it was anywhere from 100 to 65 kilometers an hour faster than anything else that the opposition had at that point in time. And like I said before, the tail, the tail section. So it obviously has the tail planes to stick out to the side and one tail going up and another fin coming down. Now, the landing gear on this thing, which um, we'll get to a little bit later, but for the landing gear to actually clear the propeller and the ground and because of the tail section was over six feet high, a fully grown man could actually walk underneath one of these planes while it, had, while it had landed and still had plenty of room to spare. This was a very, very big plane. Um, yeah, and here's we have the air intake for, for the rear engine. Yes, the Luftwaffe was quite desperate to get this thing into, um, uh, into operational service because uh, they knew how impressive its performance was, but it just wasn't meant to be, I'm afraid. Now, let we have a look at the wings. Big wings on these. And uh, as you can see, and here's where the landing gear would um, retract back up into the body. And over here, these are some of the covers that would go on the fuselage. And these were some of the exhaust points for the, uh, for the engines. Um, the details on this are absolutely exquisite. Like, I'll hold it up to the camera. Let's see if you can get a better look. Like the, the riveting here the to the smallest conceivable details they're absolutely minute um the the camera probably won't do it justice but i'm very impressed with um of, of the effort that hong kong models has gone gone to to get some to the authenticity into the design of this very very impressed actually yeah now we'll have a look what have we got here ah engines One of the front and and the rear, just there. So front and rear. Once again, guys, details on this thing, fabulous. Um, let me show this up to the camera, and you can see where the larger parts of the engine. Also, the, look the details that they've put into it when it comes to um, riveting and and whatnot is excellent. But they haven't overcomplicated. Um, they haven't overcomplicated the engine. As you can see, like a lot of the uh, pipes and hydraulics, hosing and whatnot is already part of the pieces. So there's enough pieces for it to be, uh, you know, fun to put together without making it too simple, but without making it too, uh, too annoying because too many fiddly small pieces can sometimes get on your nerves a little bit, but excellent, excellent. Okay. Now, what do we got here? Ah, uh, some of the wheels. And, yeah, I will just do this one for now. This would be, these would probably be the uh, wheels that would go under the, uh, uh, under the wings for the, the landing gear at the rear. It had a tricycle, um, a tricycle landing, uh, landing gear configuration, which made a lot of planes from World War II were tail draggers especially the fight especially the combat aircraft but this one had um had a tricycle landing gear which was quite rare for its time um the americans uh Aero cobra also had um also had uh, tricycle landing gear that one had its engine behind the pilot as well um but only the one engine not the two like this but i digress yes um another innovative feature of the um dornier 335 was it had an ejection seat yeah, it did. It, when the pilot knew he couldn't recover the plane or it was damaged beyond salvaging, bail out. Yeah, excellent. Now, survivability uh, built in is always a good feature for, um, you know, for, for any fighter plane. Being able to, you know, save your pilots from certain death. Now, let's see what we got here. Oh, we've got more more smaller pieces of the engine and more the landing gear just there and this is the one of the engine cowling that would go over the front of the engine and here we have what looks to be a fuel tank 
actually. And once again, beautiful details, beautiful, beautiful details. And here we have, that would probably be the uh, spine that would go from the cockpit all the way back to the, back to the rear tail. Um, as well as being remarkably fast, the uh, test pilots that the test pilots that flew the Dornier 335 said that it was an excellent plane. That its handling was was very very good. It was still quite maneuverable for an aircraft of its size, and because of the engines at the front and the rear, it had no dangerous spin um, characteristics about it. And let's have a look. And here we have more parts of it. And this is the front of, this is the, oh, actually, no, sorry, that's the rear uh, that would go over the engine. And there's the exhaust port, exhaust ports there. And more doors for, oh, actually, they might look like they might be part of the, oh, no, 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 they're doors, they're doors. They would go probably over parts of the landing gear as well. More of the engine cowling. And then you have the air intakes for the engine at the front. And ah, the pilot seat. And now we're going to check out, I wanna to get to the weapon side of things. Ah, yes, excellent, just as I said that. So let's have a look see. Here we have covers over the, the front or the leading edge of the wing. And these were the, the covers that went over the guns that would have gone in the, into the wing. Very heavy weapons payload actually on um, the Dornier 335. It had a 30 millimeter cannon that fired through the center of the propeller and these two 30 millimeter cannons in each wing and it had two 15 millimeter cannons uh, just above, above the uh, engine in the nose, which would be here. And these were the two firing ports there and there. Um, so that is an awful amount of uh, explosive shells that are be coming at you. Even a small, a, a small burst would be a very devastating hit on on any aircraft or any or anything that it's pointing at on the ground and then we have more of the landing gear there that looks to be the front one the nose landing gear it's quite and once again because it was so high off the ground look at that that was the nose wheel look at this uh, how long that, how long that was and here you have the two 15 millimeter guns that would go in the forward part of the plane yeah what do we got here? And then we got the covers for the landing gear. And we got some more of the wing tips. And then the final part. I'll move those final part there. Love the details in this. I'm going to um, show you some more. Here we have the cockpit and the interior. Wonderful details there. Look at all of the hydraulics. And then you've got the more on the inside there. Turn it over. Ah, oh, then we have the propellers, the front and the back of the propellers. The, um, the moldings on these are really good. I've, I've, I like how only a very little bit is always attached to the pieces. So snipping them off would be, um, would be really good, would be really easy and sanding it back. Here though on the propeller, I do got to point out, I'm not a fan of this, um, but then again, no model kit's perfect, how the, the molding is attached to the actual propeller itself. I've never been a fan of that. I actually prefer it when it's attached to the, uh, to the inside because this, these are so thin, you know, when snipping it off, it's always a, a little bit of a nervous experience that you can damage the propeller in any way. So on the ins, attaching it to the, uh, Attaching it to the center there, I've always been a, a much bigger fan of that. And this model as well, because it was a tricycle landing gear, and obviously the, the engine wasn't real, it comes with weights. Weights to put in, the, put in the nose to level it out so it doesn't tilt back. And here we go. And last but not least, the canopy of the plane, just there. The unmistakable segmented windows that were very common on a lot of German aircraft. And here you have these two blisters, just there and there. Now those were put on either sides 
the canopy that uh, came down over the pilot. That was so that he could sort of turn his head and look around behind uh, behind him. Or when he was had the plane tilted to one side, he'd be able to look down a little bit more. Um, one of the drawbacks of the Dornier 335 was it did not have a very good field of view, actually. And because the cockpit was um, far back and there was the engine was so far forward that um, didn't have a lot of time to line up um, line up a shot against opponents, especially uh, especially ground uh, ground attack. Actually, some of the other drawbacks was is was a very big plane, so it was quite noticeable. And uh, when if it um, they always thought that if it was attacking attacking uh, ground targets, that it would have been a fairly easy target because it was so big. Uh, but it never got used in combat, so I guess we'll never ever know. Um, and then, last but not least, we have ah here the all of the decals. We've got the German insignia there, and more more of the markings there, and the French the French markings. Yes, the uh, the Allied forces had no idea of the existence of the. Dornier 335 until um, a French pilot was the first one, first man to see one. He was flying a group, uh, he was the lead pilot in a group of Hawker Tempests, if I remember correctly, and he witnessed, he saw it flying low to the ground. He tried to chase after it to shoot it down, but because it was so fast, it was just gone. And then after the war was over, when they captured the, um, what very few uh 335s were made he said he recognized and he said that was the plane that um that i saw that was the one that got away but yeah anyway cool cool i hope you enjoyed that um learning all about such a such a rare plane how very few were made and there's only one left actually in the whole world there's only one Dornier 335 left but yeah, thanks for tuning in, guys. I hope you enjoyed uh, today's episode once again. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. I uh, hope to see you in the store soon. And as always, rock and roll, guys.